Uh, I have Commander Eli Reyes here. He's with the technology unit. I want to uh, give him a shout out. He's going to talk about the body worn cameras that are coming in. Uh, yeah. Go Good evening. Hey, uh, like you said, I'm Commander Reyes. I'm the, currently the technology commander. I've been in that position for about two years now. Um, and I'll be actually transferring to South Patrol on Monday. Um, so I'm still going to be involved in this project, though. It's kind of been my, my life for the last couple of years. So I um, just want to give you guys an update. I've been going around making all the commander's forms citywide to give everybody an update on where we are with the body camera program. Uh, just to kind of give you guys a little historical perspective, you know, we've had in-car camera systems for over 10 years in the city of Austin. So every car, every motorcycle, uh, Mark Patrol unit in the city of Austin currently has an in-car video system. Um, and so, you know, a few years back, we looked at the body camera technology when it came out. And at that time, the technology just was not where it needed to be because the battery life wasn't good. The, the security of the devices wasn't good. And so we put the project off several years ago. Now the technology has gotten very good and it's where we needed it to be. And then last year we went out for a request for a proposal to procure uh, body cameras along with the funding provided by council. <clears throat> so there's a lot of things uh, that come, go into consideration when implementing uh, the body worn camera program. Uh, last legislative session, the legislature passed Senate Bill 158, which kind of uh, dictates to police departments what they need to have in their body-worn camera policy and when the body cameras can be turned on and when they need to be turned off or given the officer discretion about turning them off when interviewing certain types of victims. Um, and then uh, I'm going to cover the policy, uh, some of the specifications, and then where we're going from there, and then we'll cover some questions at the end if you guys have any. Okay. So like I said, the, the law defines a body camera, it also defines a private space. The reason why it's important that the law defines a private space, because it protects people when they're being recorded on body camera video with officer involvement um, from that video being released uh, just to anybody. So for example, if uh, you're in your home and you've been victimized, um, domestic violence, and you call 911 and the officer shows up and they go in your residence and they interview you, take the report and they leave, um, your neighbor might be like, oh, the officer was in there, I want to do an open records request and, and see that video, I want to see what happened. Um, the law defines a private space and it's, uh, it's a, a residence or any place that a person has an expectation of privacy and it also includes uh, the interior space of your vehicle. Um, and so what it does is it makes it so that that video can't be released without your written consent. Um, so it kind of gives a level of protection for you guys. Um, and, the, and the law tells us when we should have the camera on and our policy has to have tell the officers when to turn it on and when they can turn it off. Um, it says that it can only be activated for a law enforcement purpose. So we can't just have the camera on all the time just walking around recording everybody for no reason. Um, and we may not require an officer to turn the camera on and leave it on for his entire shift. Um, that is not permitted. It also requires that every officer or anybody that's going to touch the body-worn camera video receive training prior to the deployment of the body-worn cameras. And all videos have to be kept for 90 days, minimum 90 days. They will be kept in accordance with the retention laws of the state, depending on what type of violation is captured on the incident. For example, if it's a traffic stop, the retention would be 180 days unless it's still pending prosecu prosecution. Uh, for a felony offense, it could be kept for 10 years. It just depends on the level of offense and when the district attorney or county attorney says it's okay to get rid of that video. I want to talk to you guys a little bit about requesting videos. How can you as a citizen go about requesting a body-worn camera video? I also have some handouts that I'll leave up here at the end if you guys want to take one with you. Um, so you can request videos in one of these four ways. You can go to the police station in person. You can email uh, that email address up there. You can fax a request in or you can mail a request in to that address right there. Um, go ahead. The requirements for obtaining body-worn camera video are laid out in the state law and we're required to abide by the state law when releasing body-worn camera video. So the public request must contain the date and time, the location, and the name of one or more persons known to be the subject of the recording. These are for videos that just occur in the general public. Say, for example, down on 6th Street. Okay? If uh, you want a copy of a video of uh, a person
person, a friend of yours that was arrested on 6th Street and it's in the public, if you know the date, time, location, and the name of that person, you can receive the video, okay? Because it happened in a public space, right? Good. Police may not release any part of a video made in a private space or a recording of a misdemeanor punishable by fine only without written permission from the person involved. Okay? That's the protection we were talking about. A misdemeanor punishable by fine only is a, a traffic ticket. So if you receive a traffic ticket, that video can't buy, be released without your written permission. On the same note, if you receive a, a ticket for uh, crossing mid-block, you know, jaywalking, um, you, that video would not be able to be released without your written permission. Okay? Good. It is a crime for the agency to release a video. It's actually a Class A misdemeanor, which is a pretty high-level crime. So if anybody in the police department releases a video outside of what the law allows, then it is a punishable crime. And then the next thing is a video of use of deadly force by an officer or the investigation of an officer cannot be released to the public until all criminal and administrative processes have been completed. Okay, that's the same process that we have now with our in-car camera systems. That's evidence in a crime or it's evidence in, say, for example, an officer involved shooting. We take that, it's evidence, it goes to the district attorney's office. They do a grand jury process. At the conclusion of the grand jury, usually that same day, the grand jury will release that video to the public. Okay? There is an exception in the law that says that a law enforcement agency may release a video if the agency believes or the agency determines that the release of the video advan advances a law enforcement purpose. This is what we like to call the Crime Stoppers Clause. So if there is a critical incident or an officer involved shooting and somebody got away or there's a witness or a, a suspect on the video, then we could release the video requesting the public's help to identify that person or help us find that person. Okay, that's the law enforcement purpose. Um, and that will be up to uh, the chief of police and the district attorney as to if that video could be released for, if it meets the definition of a law enforcement purpose. Okay. So some of the things that we have in our policy is that the officers have to test the camera. Um, one of the reasons why we waited a little bit longer than a lot of other agencies to deploy the body cameras is because we wanted a specific type of technology. Okay? We wanted something with Austin Police Department that our community expects of us that other communities don't have. And that is when the officer exits the patrol car, their body camera automatically turns on. Okay? That's what happens right now with our in-car system. We were the first agency to employ that with the in-car uh, in system so that right now, that's the way it happens. When our officers open the car, their cameras turn on. It takes the equation out of the hands of the officer to manually turn the camera on um, because if they're responding to an emergency situation, you don't want them fumbling for the camera. You want them taking care of business, right? So now when the officer opens the door, the body camera will turn on. If it's something that they're not going to need the body camera on for, then they can manually turn the camera off. Um, like, let's say they're going to lunch, right? They don't need the camera on, but when they open the door, the camera's going to turn on. Um, but they can manually turn it off under those situations. Commander, how yes, would sir? that work for a bicycle patrol officer or foot yeah. patrol? So, uh, there are no automatic triggers as far as a bicycle patrol. We're not going to put something in the seat that when they get up, <laughs> it turns on. Um, but I will tell you, um, in case anybody was not aware, um, the winning bidder for our body camera project was Taser. Um, we're under um, uh, the, the losing uh, bidding company filed a lawsuit, said that the solicitation process wasn't legal, so we're waiting for this litigation to finish. Um, but one of the things that, we're, that comes with the Taser product is the ability to get Taser. So the Taser body cameras have Bluetooth technology, um, and what will happen is um, we will actually replace the battery of the, the taser itself with a taser that has Bluetooth technology in it. And so when the officer powers on the taser, right, powers it on, it sends a Bluetooth signal to the body camera and activates it. Okay. So that is one of the things that will be for the walking beat guys or whatever. So if they power the taser on, their camera, and it's Bluetooth, right? Their camera and every camera within 25 feet will turn on if it's not already on. Okay. So that's one of the one of kind of one of the things that we took into consideration when, when selecting our vendor. Right. We'll have spare cameras. If the camera's not functioning when the officer tests it, we can issue them another camera. Um, examples of when it's going to be turned on: traffic stop, DWI investigation, warrant service, 
investigatory stops, call for service. Basically, anytime an officer is dispatched to a call for service, their camera is going to be on. You know? If you're interacting with an officer, I would just believe that the camera's on if they're there for a law enforcement purpose. If they're just standing on the corner, it's probably not going to be on. Um, so. Rapid response. This is going to come into play for like the, the downtown walking beat guys. You know, a lot of times when these guys are downtown, something happens right in front of them, and they need to take immediate action. So they're not going to have time to turn their camera on. So what the, what our policy says is, if they need to take immediate action, then they're going to take the action they need to take, and then once they have a, a time, they'll turn the camera on. The good thing about that is the camera has it's always recording. So once they hit the the camera, it backs up up to two minutes, we can configure that, 30 seconds, a minute, or two minutes. It backs up and it will actually, like a DVR, record from two minutes prior. There just won't be any audio, but you will have video. Okay, so that was another feature that we wanted to make sure we had, was that what we call the buffer, 30 second buffer, or one minute. We have that in the car system now. Um, request to stop recording. The officer is not going to stop the recording if the person tells them to. If you're interacting with somebody and you know, you're a suspect in a crime and he says, oh, is your camera on? You say, yeah, the camera's on. I want you to turn it off. I mean, that defeats the purpose of us having the cameras if, you, if we turn them off when someone asks us to. Okay? Uh, so the officer is going to explain the policy to them that our policy requires that the cam body camera be activated until the conclusion of the incident okay? or until all law enforcement um, activity has ceased. So an example of when it has ceased is if you're interviewing just a, a victim or a witness and it's non-controversial and you don't really need to record the, the statement or anything or some, some protected victims and we'll go into that here in a little bit or people um, that request privacy because they want to remain anonymous and not be on video. Um, our sergeants will con conduct uh, audits of the videos just like we do with the in-car system now. They'll make sure the officer's testing them. They'll watch a video from beginning to end, watch how the officer does his job, see if there's anything that, if he's interacting with the public correctly, if there's any violation of the policy, and he'll take the appropriate action when he conducts that monthly audit. <laughs> and just so you all know, those audits are done by our risk management team. They're, they're sent out um, with a back date, okay? So I'm not gonna tell you tomorrow, I'm gonna audit your camera. Make sure you're acting good tomorrow, right? So what happens is the risk management team uh, will send an email to all the supervisors and say the audit for the quarter or month of August is, um, we're the 28th right now, is August 16th. You need to go back to August 16th and watch a video and watch the taser check and everything for that day for your officers. So. Officers cannot convert for personal use any of these body-worn cameras cannot make personal copies, and they cannot post anything to social media without authorization. Now, we do have social media accounts, so we can post to them for official reasons if we need to put something on social media for that law enforcement purpose to identify a victim or a suspect. And, and so what happened was, right now, we have officers that buy their own body cameras because we don't issue body cameras, right? So what happened is we had to have a policy in place. So we put a, a basic policy in place so that our officers have had some clear guidelines about when to turn it on and when to turn it off. And then what we did is we started working really closely with a lot of community groups and victims' rights uh, people, victim uh, like from Safe Place, um, ACLU, uh, Austin Justice Coalition, uh, NAACP. I actually have another meeting with them next Tuesday with the whole group of people, uh, the police monitor's office, the police union. Uh, there's about 10 of us, and we go went over this policy, proposed changes, uh, we're coming to mutual agreements on wording and all this kind of stuff, so um, go ahead. So these are some changes that are, that are going to uh, be in the new policy. We're just going to tell people that they're on video it, when it's safe to do so. Okay. So you know, I'm not going to walk up to you and say, hey, I'm recording you. you know, first, I'm going to make sure it's safe, and then at some point during the interaction, unless it's going to interfere with an investigative purpose, then I'm going to tell you that you're being recorded. Okay? We're not required by law to do that. We, it, you can record anybody you want. He can record anybody he wants, right? Like they do all the time. They don't ask permission from us. We don't have to ask permission from you. But we will let you know by our policy when it becomes safe uh, to go ahead and let you know that we're recording you. Okay? Come in.
Yep. Do the body cameras that were selected have a visual indicator that they're recorded? No. And it's an officer safety issue. There is no visual indicator. Can you imagine two o'clock in the morning? Yeah. No. Two o'clock in the morning, you're on a call out with an armed guy with a gun in a house, and you have ten little red dots around the house, right? <laughs> I mean, so yeah. So there is no visual indicator. Thank you. That's a good question. So some of the things that we have in there are going to protect wit witnesses and victims. So victims of sexual assaults, victims of family violence. If it's a non-confrontational interview and it's just the victim or the witness and they don't want to be recorded, then the officer will have the ability to turn that off. You know, we do believe that it is beneficial to record that statement because it is evidence and it's going to memorialize the statement that that person's giving and it can be used in court and it can be used to corroborate things later on. But you know, when you don't want to re-victimize the person again, especially if they're a victim of sexual assault and then they have to have this video um, of them over and over again just reliving it. So it is going to be an option under those situations, but what we may do is we may still record audio. Um, and we'll bring our victim services counselors in for this because it is non-confrontational. There is no rush to get that statement. So we will bring, if we have victim services counselors in the department, we'll bring that person there and we'll come to a mutual agreement on how we're going to record that or if we are or not. Other things that we won't record, um, a potential witness who requests confidentiality or desires to be anonymous. A victim or witness uh, that doesn't want to be recorded and the situation is non-confrontational. Tactical briefings, private locker rooms unless you're in there taking police action. Doctors or lawyers offices unless you're taking police action. In a medical hospital unless you're taking action. So a lot of these things are just kind of spelled out. You know, right now it says officers will only use the camera for law enforcement purpose, which kind of tells you that, but this just kind of spells out some situations, and this was mutually agreed upon language from these other groups, that they just wanted it in writing, that there was an understanding that these wouldn't be done. So, go ahead. So in the event, um, just to clarify, in the event an officer is, is taking a break, going to job a job to get a cup of coffee, likely his camera's going to be off, right. and, and while he's in there, he encounters hotel security or employees dealing with the situation. Yeah. yeah, officer can manually activate the camera anytime he feels necessary to do so. Yeah. And the good thing is, just like the car cameras, it backs up. Yeah. Oh, nice. So if something happens in front of you and you see it, then you can hit it and right. it actually had already recorded it. So. Um, and the last one here is to monitor a person's based solely upon the person's political or religious beliefs or upon the exercise of the person's constitutional rights to freedom of speech. Uh, merely for them being in there. So it's basically, if you're protesting, uh, we're not going to go out and just record you and say, just because you're there protesting. If you're not violating the law, we're going to be there to keep the peace, to protect your First Amendment rights to peacefully protest, and we're not going to record you um, unless it becomes uh, uh, a law enforcement purpose and there's a, a law breaking or a riot or something like that. Okay. Talked a little bit about the remote triggers. Officers will have the ability to categorize the videos. Um, the camera is going to see what the officer sees. It's not going to have infrared vision. It's not going to have enhanced vision. It's important that when we show these videos that it show exactly what the officer sees. Because we don't want to have this thing of where you guys, oh, well, didn't he see that? Well, because it's infrared or something? You know, no, he didn't see it because he can't see infrared. You know. Um, and then security features including audit trails and watermarks. This is a very important feature right here. Um, because what happens is if an officer is watching the video on their computer screen, right? There's going to be a watermark that has, you know, I'm AP3279, that's me, okay? Um, it, on the back of the video, it's going to show AP3279. It's going to show I'm watching the video. So if I download that video or I record that video, it's going to have my employee number on there. So that video shows up on YouTube, it's going to have my badge number on there that I was watching it at the time. Because what happened was several years ago, um, the, the software has an auditing trail that shows who's watching it. So it'll show uh, AP3279 watched it at 10 o'clock on this day, and then so-and-so watched it on this day, and then so-and-so watched it on this day, right? Um, but what happened was an, somebody took their, uh, their cell phone and they put it on and they videotaped it, and then a week later it shows up on YouTube, but who's the one that put it on YouTube? You know, there was no, no way to know. They know that 10 people watched the video, but now with these watermarks on there, it clearly is going to show who is the person watching it at the time. So, good. 
So right now, we're, like I said, we have this pending litigation. Uh, the next court date, I believe, is for November. Um, and then hopefully we can move forward after that. Uh, infrastructure, we do have some cabling that we need to add to the downtown building. There's some asbestos in, though. Imagine that. Uh, so we're going to have to work around the asbestos uh, to put some more uh, cables in there for the internet connection to upload the videos. Um, and then we'll begin the training, and then we're going to deploy the cameras. The first people to get the cameras are going to be people in the downtown area. Um, and then from there, basically all patrol is going to come first, right? So we were supposed to do 500 cameras um, this fiscal year, 500 cameras next year, and then 500 cameras the third year. So right now, if things go accordingly, it looks like we'll be able to start deploying in January. So we'll probably do 250 cameras a month for four months and then just catch up and do 1,000 next year, which will get all of patrol. Um, and that's our primary focus is getting all of patrol right now. Every um, detective and below will be issued a body camera. Okay? So detectives will be able to go out and do field interviews and they'll be able to have a camera on them. Um, and then a lot of times right now what we're doing is detectives are having to work patrol, like once a quarter or non-patrol officers have to work patrol. So we're just going to make sure that everybody has uh, one issue. So, next slide. Okay. Yep. Um, I've noticed on the DMAB that there's a timestamp, a moving timestamp. Is there going to be anything comparable on this one to keep from tampering? A, there will be a timestamp. There, there is. There is a time step on it. There is no way for anybody to tamper with the video. What will happen is when the officer is done with his shift, he's going to take his camera, he's going to dock it in a docking station, it's going to upload to the secure cloud. Once it's up there, nobody can modify anything on that video. Not even an administrator can delete the video. Um, you can't do anything to it. The only thing that you can do to it is you can redact it. So there's a software program in there where you can blur somebody's face but it creates a copy of the video that is redacted. The original video will always be kept in its original state. It will, can never be tampered with. Okay. Yes, sir? Will they be equipped with GPS just in case they come out of So, um, the camera itself, no, will not have a GPS in it. Um, so, we just kind of go into the next thing I'm going to talk about real quick. Um, when we tested the cameras, right, the Taser camera comes with an iPod. Uh, Taser has an app that comes on the iPod, and your app integrates with the camera. So you open up the app, you can actually see the video, Bluetooth connects, you can see the camera, and then when you stop it, you can actually categorize the video, make notes on it, and it changes it on here. There's nothing stored on here, it's just kind of a talking device, right? Um, and so when we were testing the cameras, um, through after the process was done, we had got an open records request for a body camera video, right? And so there's only very few of us that know how to use the system because we were just testing it. So I logged into the system, I'm trying to find this video, and I pull up a, a map, right? Uh, and I see like 10 little blue dots on the map. And I was like, all right, so I click on the blue dot and it has the video. So I click on the video, it pops up. And I was like, all right, well there's the video. Uh, so why is there only 10 blue dots on here? Why, where are the rest of the dots, all right? There should be more than 10 videos on here. And so we're talking with the technical guys and we talked with the person who was using the, the that camera, he said, oh, I didn't use the, the iPod. I didn't want to carry two devices. So I used my iPhone instead. Well, because he used his iPhone, it automatically geolocated the location of where the video was taken. And it put it on the map and it put it in the video, right? Um, so when we were going through the, the process of getting body cameras, we have been trying for years to get our officers issued cell phones. We've been trying for years. Right now, this is our communications method. Has anybody ever seen one of these? It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, so, yeah. This is a one-way antiquated communication tool with no way to confirm or deny that the person received the message, right? So we've been trying to get officers issued cell phones. Um, and so uh, once that occurred, um, we thought it was a, a good opportunity to get asked city council to uh, approve issuing officers cell phones because it was we are able to leverage the pricing down on the Taser contract um, because we were going to use, uh, we were going to integrate the camera systems with the, our CAD system, our 911 system, to automatically add the location of the 911 call based on the officer's employee number into the system. But having the ability to geolocate the actual place where it occurred, we were able to knock off a significant amount of money, like over a million dollars off of the contract because we didn't have to do that. Um, so even though the, um, 
the, uh, the body cameras are on hold right now. We are moving forward with the issuing of the officer's cell phones because having the ability to use it with the body camera, that's just one little piece of the puzzle. Um, there's a lot of other things that officers are going to be able to use the cell phones for. Um, and one of the biggest things is uh, taking pictures in the field. <laughs> um, right now we have like a, a handful of cameras um, and they have to ask, wait and ask for somebody to bring a camera over. And then when they take the pictures, they got to go back to the substation, take out the SD card, upload it to the evidence thing. It's just a time consuming process. Um, when, once we do move with body cameras, they'll be actually, actually be able to take the pictures and upload them to the secure server right from the, the site with the case number and they won't even have to do anything with it. Um, so uh, translation applications, mapping, um, for our DTAC guys, you know, park guys, we'll be able to geolocate where they're at. You know, right now we don't know where our officers are, uh, except unless they're in a car. The cars have to, uh, tracking systems in them, but motorcycle guys, walking beat guys, parks guys, if, if we can't find one of them and they're not answering their radio, there's no way for us to find them. Um, and so it's an officer safety concern as well. Um, so that's all I have for the body camera stuff. Is there any questions about the body camera stuff? Erma Linda. Uh, Permission to give to release is it done during the encounter? Will the individual seek help or the victim or the perpetrator? Do they sign something right now? No, if they, 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 they want to, the, to request a copy of the video, then they would do it at headquarters or through the process, the open records process, just like any video they do now. Um, so there is no, um, no ability for a person to sign away their rights at the scene, you know. Um, I've talked with a lot of people, and so, you know, like I said, if you're on a traffic stop, right, and um, that video, you have to sign permission in order for someone to get access to that video. Um, there have been some requests for us at the conclusion of our traffic stop, I just wrote you a speeding ticket and say, um, would you like to sign away your rights so this video can be released to anybody? Um, I mean, I don't know who would want to sign away their rights so their video could be released to anybody. No. I, every time I ask, I get no answers that say yes. But there are some groups that are advocating for that. And um, so I don't understand who they're advocating for. Um, but I've been, I've probably talked to 200 people in these group settings. And nobody's raised their hand and said, I want to sign away my rights so anybody can get my video. I haven't had one person raise their hand yet. Um, so um, they are they are advocating for that. The police department is not uh, not going to uh, agree to that. Um, and so if anybody wants the video, they can just go down and sign and get the video. Uh, so I feel like I said, I do have these flyers here, these four slides on here, give you specific information about how to request the video. Any other questions about body cameras? No. Okay. The next thing I want to talk about, I'm on, I'm going to do this real quick. We've been advertising this a lot. Um, we did release a uh, mobile application last year, it's called Mobile PD. If you go to the App Store and you just type in Mobile PD, uh, Austin uh, PD Mobile, uh, you'll find the app, it's our patch. It looks just like our patch right here. On the app, there are uh, multiple uh, different things that you can use, including crime maps, anonymous tipping, phone numbers for everybody in the police department. Uh, Crime Stoppers, if you wanted to submit a tip through Crime Stoppers, uh, you can sign up for push alerts. Uh, what it looks like here, you have uh, uh, push alerts, you can um, have a directory for all the phone numbers in the department, including the Office of the Police Monitor's phone numbers on there. Um, you can uh, submit a tip right there at the top. The good thing about that submitting tip is that once you submit a tip, you can engage in two-way tip chat. That tip will go to our real-time crime center. Um, and if you submit a tip about a drunk pedicab guy and it goes to the real-time crime center, you can also include a photograph with your tip and geolocate where you're at. And they can either, A, dispatch an officer there if they think somebody needs to go there, they can create a call. Or if it's something that's non-emergency, like let's say it's your neighbor has a junk car or something, they can forward it to the district representatives and they can follow up the next day. But it, they can engage in a two-way conversation with you. That tip chat will be you guys talking back and forth about your tip. Okay. Do uh, those remain anonymous? Or? You have the option uh, to remain anonymous or to leave your information there. But, um, if you want to... Um, Submit a tip, you can categorize it. That will help us determine where the tip needs to go to. 
You can add a photo, add a location, and write your comments. And then you can engage in two-way conversation with the real-time crime center. You have crime maps on there, um, so you can pull up the map and you can zoom in to whatever level you want to and it'll tell you the date, time, and the location and the type of crime that occurred there. Um, so it can give you a broad overview. The information on there is about 48 hours old, um, so it's not current, but it's, it gives you a good idea of the types of crimes that are occurring in your area. And also, there's a, a map on there for all of the police stations. If you don't know where they are and you're in an area and you say, oh, I'm going to go get some Krispy Kremes, I'm going to drop it by the nearest police station and you can pull it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, Crime Stoppers uh, News, we keep it updated with our news stuff. Uh, we ha also have links to all of our social media sites on there, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Nextdoor, and YouTube. We have our own YouTube page. Uh, all of our interviews that we do uh, with the media, our full length interview is on YouTube. When we do an interview, the media shows 15, 10 seconds of what we said. If you want to see the full length interview, you can just go to our, new, our YouTube page and the link is on, on the app. So. The phone numbers are there uh, for the entire uh, department. Um, there's our YouTube page. Um, we do have keep some photos on there, gallery photos that we uh, upload periodically so you guys can see what things we're doing. Those are all the rest of our um, social media applications. If you want to file a report, you can do that on the app. It's a non-emergency report. You just pick what type of report you want to file, and then fill out the stuff on the report, hit submit, and you'll get a case number. Okay. And then there's some links over there um, that you can also use for uh, um, sex offender registration through DPS, looking for sex offenders. Uh, good. And, um, one of the things that I'm, I'm real proud of my team is that uh, every year the state of Texas has a technology uh, summit and this year the Austin Police Department's mobile app won the best app in the state of Texas for community engagement. So, um, so. How many contenders out of curiosity? The whole, every, um, I don't know how many submitted applications, but it's every uh, government agency in the state of Texas can submit. So. And I actually had to do a presentation at the conference. There was a few months, um, and uh, showcase the app, and then uh, there was actually a, a vote there from the top three. Uh, so, and we won first place. So, congratulations. So, um, so download it, uh, use it, be anonymous, submit tips. We're trying to send everything out in detail on that app. So, yeah. if there's a road closure due to something, or. I use those yeah, all the time and I have it focused down to my building. Yeah, you guys can sign up for push alerts, push notifications. If we have an emergency situation going on, a shooter or a school lockdown, you'll get a notification on the, on the app. That's how I heard about the K2 thing. It came through yep, on the came app. Through the app. Yep, the K2 thing came through on the app. Yep, sure did. All right, well, thank you guys for your time. I'll be around if you guys have any questions for me.